Okay, well, welcome back. We are in Compassion Alchemy Module 4, day-long mini retreat. We're going to do some more practices. Uh, let's do an interpersonal activity by typing into the chat box, if you are capable of that. Uh, which practice did you enjoy today? And perhaps why? So we did stupa sitting. We did yoga nidra. We did some sheer presence of awareness. And then we did contemplative interpersonal uh, listening and learning together. Those are the four things. So did you enjoy anything today? And if so, what and why? Let me know. Uh, your responses may cause me to cancel part of my plan. Okay. Okay, let's see all of the above. Being with being, yes. Uh, uh, and someone loved the stupa meditation and lots of internal energy rising in yoga nidra and the deep rest. Uh, I was going to do a deep rest and then I got inspired. So I didn't get depressed, which is kind of nice, um, but I did get inspired. And so I just did Qigong instead. And that is what it is. Okay. Well, if there are more responses coming through, then they can come through. But I will then attempt to teach this class. So let's do a little theoretical, and then we'll dive into another practice session. And the theoretical Oh, I don't think I have my old whiteboard uh, left over still, but let's let's draw it again. So we've got bing, and on this side we had upset, and on this side we had agency. So we've got the agency upset continuum. And then one other thing that I wanted to introduce, this is sort of just for my contemplation this week, is you could also have another axis, which is the, uh, let's say, passion and dispassion continuum, the passion and dispassion continuum. So I just want to share these notions with you um, in one sense, because it helps me uh, share with you what I always disliked the most about Buddhism, which as a Buddhist priest, I feel very confident in, in talking about. So you've got the upset versus agency continuum. You've got the passion to dispassion continuum. And um, it's not like that the middle way is sort of halfway between, you're half upset and half agentic. Um, practice is really tending toward the uh, agency aspect of this continuum. Um, but on the passion and dispassion, we do want to recognize that these are sort of two facets of our being. Um, so for example, if you're completely dispassionate, as some meditation schools recommend, then you can't be compassionate, right? Compassion contains the pathos in it. It contains a fullness of feeling. So the discussion, what I always disliked about Buddhism is um, many of you will know, at least if, if through this class, if nothing else, but Buddhism means a lot of different things, right? There are tantric schools that visualize stupas, and there are forest monks uh, in Thailand who don't visualize anything. Um, and there are modern Western people who have culturally appropriated a bunch of stuff and called it Buddhism. And um, it's a big wide field, uh, but, you will know if you look at the older Buddhist writings, um, the goal is nirvana. The goal is nirvana. Most of us have, have heard of this. And if you translate that literally, um, the van comes from the same root as our word fan and wind. And it means like to, to blow, like wind. 
Um, and then near is, is a negation, right? So it means like no wind, but literally it can be translated as blown out or extinguished, totally extinguished. And um, so you get versions of Buddhist teaching where the goal is to be extinguished, you know? And this is where you get the teachings of like, oh, life is suffering. It's just all suffering all the time. And the best way to be with that is to not be at all. Um, have you, have we heard this version of Buddhist teaching or, you know, other sadhus and traditions also teach this type of nirvana? Um, it's the thing that always sort of ticked me off the most about Buddhism, because when I discovered Buddhism, um, it was like a lifeline to emotional regulation, um, because there are techniques by which, oh yeah, the whirling um, hallucinations and emotional machinery of the mind operate like an illusion. And it's really cool to learn how to pause from being whirled in the illusion, right? You want to be in like the center part of the washing machine rather than the spin cycle. Um, spin cycle is known as samsara, right? Um, in the world, but not, but being detached from it. Yes. Um, and this is like, this is the worst part, you know, cause it's like, oh, I mean, either, like if there was a way maybe to exit the world entirely and just like dissolve into life, like that might be cool. I mean, I'm not going to discount it. Um, or you can be in the world, but like bringing spirit and inspiration into reality. But a lot of time we actually get like a lose-lose scenario. Like you're in the world of quote unquote suffering and trying not to be. <laughs> and just like, oh, well, if I just don't have any emotions about things or something like that. So um, I think that's a whole just terrible ball of wax. And um, it has to do with these continuums of the upset to agency continuum and the passion to dispassion continuum. So uh, for today, if you want a little, like, I feel I learned this from a Lama of mine, and I feel it's like the, the master code to understanding Buddhism, is that anytime you see Buddhist writing that says suffering, they're translating this word dukkha, D-U-K-K-H-A, um, and just put in there the word upset, Put in there the word upset, because literally um, th this word itself implies, and um, the Buddha himself used this metaphor, um, dukkha means, uh, the etymology of it comes from the, the hole for your axle in a wheel on your wagon or something, you know, from the olden days, right? And um, dukkha means a hole that's the wrong shape. So as you go down the road, it goes clank, 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 you know, and eventually your wheel will fall off. And it's the opposite of what Buddha's teaching was said to be, which was good in the beginning, good in the middle, good in the end, right? If you've got a miss, well, on your car, you could think of, if you've got a misaligned wheel while you're driving, it's going, clank, 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 clank. you're having a rough ride and you're worried, which you should be. And then when the wheel falls off, right. that's also a bummer. And then when you have to pay to get your whole like axle and suspension and alignment repaired, that too is a bummer. <laughs> it's bad in the beginning, bad in the middle and bad in the end. And then the worst thing, um, yeah, the worst thing would be if you never learned from that experience, right? And this is what mystically they compare samsara to is like you're reincarnating and then having to start from square one again with all, you know, it's different than some like new age traditions that are like, oh no, you reincarnate and you've got new lessons. Buddhism is a little more pessimistic. They're like, well, reincarnate, your ego got totally dissolved in the death process. And so good luck, you know, it's just a realm of ignorance and suffering. And it would kind of, th there's ways to apply that less mystically to our lives, but it would be kind of like you went through that whole thing with your wheel falling off and then you never integrated the information that you need to like have your tires checked every so often when you go get an oil change or something like that oh i changed my own oil well good bring it into the tire shop then every once in a while and just get get it rotated and checked and stuff just zoom, tighten up those lug nuts if you had never learned that lesson 
then regardless of how cool a car you get, one day you'll be driving down the road. <laughs> oh no, what's that? I feel worried and it's a rough ride. And then, oh no, now I'm stuck. And then, oh, now it's fixed, but it cost me thousands of dollars. And so the cycle goes again. Okay, um, that was a big tangent on dukkha, but it's a great, if you know the etymology of the word, it's really groovy because then um, what it, you could translate it as like misalignment or something like that. And this gets very into how the Taoists talk about this. The yogis talk about it like in your energy body, which is if you've got this spinal stupa lined up, it's like you're a bridge between the unmanifest realm and the manifest realm. And then right in the middle is your compassionate heart right? So you've got, maybe on my drawing, I should have done it backwards, but you've got the, like the dispassionate expanse because everything is everything available to you. And then you've got like the, actually the dispassionate expanse of manifestation because everything is everything in, in manifest form. But then in the middle, you've got this, this caring, loving heart that can have a full-fledged emotional experience, but without getting upset or without getting misaligned without going into this realm of dukkha so it's really kind of a cool um, key if you were to go back and, and look at some of these um, different writings of how if we just think of it as like okay you, you know you may have pain in your life it's pretty much guaranteed um but the whole, you know, in like mindfulness-based stress reduction, they have, you know, often use the metaphor of the two darts, classic Buddhist metaphor, right? You know, you got hit with the first dart, ow! And then the second dart of pain is all of your own resistance to it. And like, why should this happen to me? And oh, I'm always getting hit with darts. And well, maybe if I figured out my trauma, then I wouldn't manifest these darts, you know? And what they propose is like, you could just stick with the first one and be like, ow, that hurt. How do I get this dart out safely and sanitize the wound, right? And there's no need for dukkha there. There's no need to get hit with the, with the dart and then go into, um, you could almost say like disconnect from reality would be another way maybe of translating dukkha that instead of being with what is, we go into a fantasy and it's really, it sucks how we do this because our minds are so powerful. So something, a bummer happens to you, right? And then what the mind does is it creates a fantasy about how good it could have been so that by comparing what a bummer this is and how good it could have been, you can cause yourself to feel pain. It's like, and we don't know that we're doing it. We don't know that we're the one who's loosening the lug nuts before we go for a drive and causing the whole fiasco to occur. So if we just figured out that like, like the dukkha is in our hands, we have to practice to have those tools, but no, it, it isn't anywhere else. Like it's, it's in our hands. Then we could, um, the bummer could happen and we could with open hearts, that say, hey, I wanted something else to happen. Well, that's part of present moment reality, but it's not this thing of like comparing and judging and deeming bad and making wrong how things are, which is how we cause ourselves suffering. It's like such a bummer. So that seems totally cool, right? But then you get like people like younger me who also have this fantasy life of like, yeah, but wouldn't it be great if we could extinguish all pain and totally transcend? And you get into these weird things where people like um, well-meaning new age uh, angel card readers on the internet, like if you express some grief, they'll come into your comments as fast as anything to like judge you. I've had them show up and they're like, oh, I thought you were like a Buddhist minister. And you're expressing frustration with the status quo? Like, of course I'm expressing frustration with the status quo. I'm a Buddhist minister. Like, the benefit of beings is my primary aim. And y'all are out here loosening each other's lug nuts. Like, of course I'm frustrated. 
Are you kidding me right now? But I don't have to be frustrated with a closed heart, right? I don't have to remove myself from the grounded presence of reality to get frustrated. There's actually a holistic and wholehearted way to get frustrated. And then you have on the other hand, so that's kind of the Zen boyfriend side, right? Zen boyfriend comes along and um, his yoga girlfriend, pardon my heteronormative terminology, it just makes it easier to tell the stupid story because it's stereotypical. And I've seen this actually in hetero relationships a number of times. Um, so Zen boyfriend, yoga girlfriend, got frustrated about how terrible life seems out there. God bless her. She's being pretty honest about it. And Zen boyfriend comes along and says, oh my God, are you feeling? You better go and do your asana practice and meditate. Calm those feelings down. Because to his mind, right, dispassion is the goal. Like that's what's right and important is, well, shit happens, but I'm stoic about it. The Stoics actually weren't as stoic as we project on them. They had all sorts of feelings and values going on. Anyway, um, but then on the other side, sometimes then yoga girlfriend will come back and go, well, you're just afraid to feel and you're always living five feet above the earth and judging everybody else. And that's not, I mean, this Zen boyfriend that I caricatured, that is true about him, but it's not always true. Some people are just calmer than you right? But we get in this like, oh, which one's right? Who's right? Passion or dispassion? Who's right? And instead of seeing those as two facets of our being, right? So we played with that in our yoga nidra. We did a doing, which was an undoing of our tension. We did a doing, which was an undoing of our tension. We golden ball. Whoa, groovy, man. I'm a golden ball now. And then we did another little doing, which was the opposite practice, right? Heavy and light, dense and open. And then we found, well, who could be both of those? Who could be opposites at the same time? How weird. And then we found being and non-doing. So we did a doing and a non-doing. And you actually have in there this polarity. There's a bit of passion. We do progressive relaxation because we see the places we're tense and we would like to be more relaxed. There is no problem with this. <laughs> there is no problem with this. But then also, if that's the only part of our being we're in touch with, we are bound to generate some more dukkha because we'll, we'll tend to get lost in what's wrong attention, in negativity bias. And we'll start, it's really weird. We go from, how could I improve this situation to... What's wrong in this room and how can I fix it? And that's a symptom of not having enough being, of just capacity to rest with as it is in the dispassionate, spacious realm. Okay, so um, this is just some fun that I contemplated all week. Let me bring up my, my axis again here if it's still on the whiteboard. Yeah, so just as a little like, oh, a little fun to think about. Um, this diagram is not perfect because like I said, you don't really need upset. You do really need agency. So this one's kind of directional, but this one, you could almost just think these are two facets of your being, right? These are two facets of your being. You could also play with this kind of thing of like, if you're upset about your upset, right? You think you're supposed to be spiritual, but you're frustrated that day both of these choices are crap, right? If you, oh, I'm so mad, I'm just gonna spiritually bypass and get dispassionate. Like it's, you can't fight upset with upset, right? This is actually um, the most mystical level in a lot of the classic teachings on nonviolence, right? Is that you can't use more upset to get rid of upset. It just doesn't work. So whether you try to use upset to get rid of upset by spacing out, pretending not to feel, or whether you feel really strongly, and oh, I'm really going to get myself to therapy and then go to the gym so that I can be better than I already am because how I am is not good enough, you've set yourself up for a real problem. The 
best thing we can do is see if we can find our agency, to see if we can find our agency. Um, oh yeah, that'll be fun. Ha I love a whiteboard. Oh, didn't work. Okay, let's do it again. There we go. See if you can find some agency. And the last little code word um, I'll share with you, a little key to traditional teachings, especially Buddhist, because that's my main ordination, um, is they talk about the six realms in Buddhism. Have you heard of these, the six realms? So they talk about, um, let me just stop sharing here. They talk about the God realm. It's like just, you can eat ice cream all day and you still get buff. You're like a fitness influencer who just eats ice cream all day. Uh, okay, okay. And all the AI art is like perfect in the God realm. There's hardly even any ethical issues except for the peons down below and we don't care about them. Okay, so you've got the God realm and then they have what's called the jealous God realm, um, which is these are folks who are, like, okay, these are the billionaires, and then these are the multimillionaires, and they want what these fools up there have got. And so they're mad about it, and they're going to get it, even though they're they're driving around in their Ferraris, and like they have the best sauna and cold plunge that any podcaster could ever get. They're still mad at the billionaires who can eat ice cream all day and not never gain weight. Um, okay, and then you have the human realm which is us. Hey, hi, how you doing? Um, and then below that, there's what's called the animal realm, um, which refers to our, our creature friends. Uh, but the main idea is it's being operated mostly out of instinct, right? There's no capacity to reflect on your behavior. Um, then they've got the hungry ghost realm, which is like addiction, basically. And then there's the hell realm, which is... Um, suffering in a way that you can't take any perspective like it it's impossible to do mindfulness-based stress reduction because you're just it's just self-perpetuating upset at all times okay that that's a psychological model it's also cosmological in traditional practice but um the thing to know they say you have to be a human to awaken as a buddha you have to be a human to start that path and there's all sorts of philosophy about why that would be the case, but I'll tell you the, the code. It's humans are the only ones in this makeup who have the capacity to direct our attention according to intention. So what makes a human, like if, if we're speaking psychologically or cosmologically, a quote unquote human is that one can... Um, direct attention according to intention, All right? So, because the idea is that if we're, you know, if you've ever had to deal with um, an addiction, mine have only been light, but I can, I can really tell you, because like addiction to nicotine, for example, long, long ago, which is like, it's as hard, harder to crack than heroin, they say, uh, brain-wise. And your cognitive function doesn't really apply to that addiction very well, right? Your thought, the, the chemical thing like puppeteers you and you will think, you know, you'll be like, oh God, I got to quit smoking. And then a day later, your brain will be like, oh yeah, but actually, right. I just heard this podcaster who said nicotine's great for acetylcholine production. And I got this talk to give. So maybe just one won't hurt me. And then all of a sudden you're a smoker again. And you go, how did that, how did that happen? Like, wait, so it's your capacity to direct your attention and intention has been subverted by this addictive chemical. And then what they, the idea that they play is that um, now certainly you might have a dog who's a tulku or we don't know what kind of cognitive experience dolphins have or whatever. That's not what they mean by an animal. They mean if you are just running around bush, whatever instinct uh, hits you, lust or fear or whatever, 
you don't have the capacity to direct your attention according to your intention. So, yeah. So um, this is how they define that. You know, if you're a God, if you're like the ultimate fitness influencer um, who just has, you can meet some of these folks. I mean, they're not all that way, but some of these folks, like they don't understand that they sort of won the genetic lottery and then they'll diss everybody else's uh, lack of resolve and never consider what types of uh, privilege or uh, caste structures that they have to fight against to even like have the modicum of health. There's all this weird ableism and stuff in the influencer industry, and it just doesn't even come on the radar. So they define being a human, one who could attain awakening, right? This, this rare and precious state as having the capacity to direct your attention volitionally. Good news is, regardless of all that convoluted philosophical discussion, that's what we're doing with meditation practices, is we are training the capacity to direct that attention on purpose. And what else we have here? Yeah. So um, the what I want to offer you today is where we want to focus our attention is on agency, where we have agency. Um, a great book you could read, um, well, you could just look into Martin Seligman, um, who was the president of the American Psychological Association in like 1985 or something, and started the movement, as far as I know, toward positive psychology. Right. This is like one, at least one of the founders of the positive psychology movement. And um, he really did a lot of work on the learned helplessness phenomenon, as well as um, he's got a great book called Learned Optimism. Learned Optimism. So that's kind of the opposite of learned helplessness. And this is one of the things that we are cultivating in the wind element aspect of our practice. So on the upset to agency uh, pipeline, <laughs> the what we want to train our brain to do is if you are listening to the NPR, you know, and they, my dream hasn't come true yet. There still isn't a radio show where they give you crummy news and then immediately tell you what you can do about it, or you can't do anything about it. So let's pray, or I don't know, but that's now your job <laughs> is you hear these things and your mind, we want to train it to immediately go to, oh, what is mine to do here? What is mine to do here? And we can find in the realm of doing. So we are in the wind element, we're outside the realm of just non-doing, like interpretations of the Tao Te Ching, where it's like, hey, everything will take care of itself, man. Um, in this model, we believe well, there is something for you to do. There's, or there's a part of your spirit which will not be complete. Your humanity won't be complete without the feeling that you're contributing in some way. And so we want to ask, is there something that is mine to contribute in this situation, right? And this is a honing the awareness toward our agency. And what's nice is the more agency, the less upset, the less suffering. This doesn't mean that you're going to lose passion because it's a different continuum. That's what I hope to represent by that graph, right? Passion and upset are, are different aspects of the continuum. We want to have the qualities of empowerment, even learned optimism, um, which is this agentic thinking. So let us learn a practice, do a practice, and then do some other practices. Okay, so I want to teach you the ouch and oops protocol. The ouch and oops protocol. Um, well, let's call it ouch and oops for open loops. This is what the protocol is called. I'm gonna type that in the chat box. Ouch and oops for open loops. Hey. Okay, briefly, ouch and oops is also a great relationship skill. Um, it just sort of simplifies things because it's the ability um, 
oh, I won't pick on anyone in class because that can get awkward. But let's say that Jenna, since I don't think I know anybody named Jenna, um, Jenna did something that really pissed me off uh, three days ago at our organizing meeting. Oh, is your daughter named Jenna? Uh, the other Jenna <laughs> did something that really pissed me off three days ago at the organizing meeting. And we have a couple of options. What we often do, don't worry, this will be a brief discussion before we practice. What we often do is we build our case to Jenna. And then we like, a lot of times, some of us even like think like, oh, wow, what kind of trauma was she undergoing to have done that to me? And then we'll tell her about it, our diagnosis. And then we, you know, it's all of this ability to make disaster fantasies. Um, and then we'll bring that to Jenna. You did this and it did this. And I bet you were thinking this. And what about this? And I, I'm standing up for myself these days and I'm not letting people do this, blah, 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 blah. And we know how well that works in relationships with people who aren't saints. I mean, if you have any saints in your life, feel free to do that to them. They love it. But everybody else, when you bring all of that bag of tricks, it's really hard for them to stay open and even hear you. So the suggestion is that you come to them and say, ouch. Okay, not just that, but, but you want to boil it down to, hey, Jenna, remember three days ago when I was bringing up my idea and you said, oh yeah, we don't need to hear about that right now. That really pissed me off. And I'm wondering what was going on there, right? That's an ouch, right? It's just letting them know, hey, that hurt. Let's open it up. And a lot of time people are really able to hear your ouch. There's a whole nonviolent communication theory behind this, you know? Um, but like, if we finish this class and you write me a note that says like, hey, you know, that heteronormative example you gave, like, I don't know, I don't know about that. That hurt a little bit because I didn't feel included or something. Like, I can totally hear that. What a lot of time people do though, when they give me comments is they go like, oh, wow, you're like a cis-centric heteronormative white guy like they told me about on social media. Should have known about you. It's like, whoa, ouch, <laughs> you know? But it's really hard, and I want to be able to hear them because I'm hoping for sainthood in a few lifetimes. I don't know, it might take quite a few now, but um, I want to hear them. But oftentimes I'm so um, busy dealing with my own ouch that I can't hear theirs. So somebody once upon a time, they said, you know, oh, develop ouch and oops. And then the other thing is, if you were to tell me, I don't know if that's a great example, let's say, or let's say you come afterwards and you're like, wow, you really talked a lot. These are the things I worry about, by the way. You really talked a lot. I wanted more meditation sessions in that thing instead of having to listen to you, Gab. Um, that's kind of a, like, that's, I can hear an ouch there. And so my job then is to say, oops. Or in other words, oh yeah, I hear where you're coming from. I guess time really did get away from me. Oh, it was the wind element. And I became a bit of a wind bag. <laughs> it happens sometimes. And so instead of what we tend to do, which is give our justifications or give our counterattacks, we can just say, oh, you know what? I kind of effed up there, didn't I? Thanks for letting me know. So if we have these code words, ouch and oops, uh, it's a great little relationship hack. The practice we're going to do, though, is a traditional practice um, modified to include some ouch and oops, because one of the things that will happen is that as you go through your day, you will likely accumulate a number of ouches and oopses. Have you ever experienced this? If you ever had to go to work or drive on a freeway or something like that, somebody cuts you off, ouch. And then right after that, your buddy calls you, or let's say your ex calls you and says, Hey, can we meet up and talk about that thing? And you go, oh, didn't we already talk about this? Sheesh. Oops. <laughs> and then, you know, you get to the cafe where you had ordered online and your drink isn't ready. And now you're going to be late. And you get stressed out. Ouch. And then because you're late, you left a bunch of people hanging and they're, they have schedules to keep and you don't feel great about that either. Oops. And throughout the day, we often accumulate these ouchuses and oopsuses. Does, does that resonate for folks? Or 
am I just living in my own little world? Please give me some feedback here on the electro machine that I'm talking to you through. Okay, good. Me and that one other guy. Okay, good. Thanks for the comments, y'all. Uh, appreciate it. So what we're going to do is a variation on um, Vajrasattva practice or um, these various kind of nectar practices where it, traditionally they visualize like a white light or um, one Shaivite tradition visualizes it as an orange light, um, whatever it is, but they tend to visualize it as coming from above and it's washing tensions and impurities from your body. But what we're going to do is we're going to combine this with a um, scan throughout our day. And as you go back, so this is you're actually thinking back in time, and we can just briefly do it for today. So if I think back uh, through what we just talked about, okay, cool. And then, okay, so like as we were just talking, there were a few moments where um, I felt tense about things that I was saying, right? And if I taught the class again, I would probably refine them a little bit. What you'll notice is that without a process, sometimes we'll tend to hold that as an open loop. Like the subconscious holds it like there's a choice that is still to be made or that could be made differently. And it holds it as tension in your body. And so what I want to do is as I go back in time, I'm visualizing this light is coming down, light is coming down, light is coming down. I go back in time and I go like, oh yeah, I said that. I didn't quite say that the way I wanted to. And I find, oh, well, do I have any agency here? This is the question. Do I have any agency here? Because when these loops get stuck in our body mind, what they do is they're holding, oh, something needs to be done. A choice needs to be made. So I go back and I go, oh yeah. I do have agency here. I can decide that if I teach the same class, I'll teach it in this way. And you imagine that that little like knot in your system gets flushed out. Then I would go back a little further. Okay, what about this? Oh, wow, my partner's been tending the fire while I'm in the other room. Okay, cool. No oops there. Okay, what about this? Oh, all right. At lunch, I ate a few more of those tortilla chips than I had really planned to not stoked about that. Okay, well, do I have any agency there? What is what is mine to do? Well, I can't go back in time. Don't want to judge myself. I'm going to do my best next time. Okay. Oh, I can just grieve. I can grieve that I didn't quite meet my values. Ah, and what you'll feel as you search for where is the agency, uh, for me, it actually feels like a little knot gets untied and then, or it's kind of a knot that's also plumbing because then the flow kind of comes through. So similarly, then, oh, I can scroll back. I can scroll back. And then um, earlier in the day, I saw someone say something mean and judgmental on social media to someone else. Ouch. All right. So I had two oopses and an ouch. And I listen and I go, okay, do I have any, Is what's mine to do here? Do I have agency here? Right. And I apply this. If I don't have any agency, then I just grieve and I let go. I can let my body mind know there's no reason to hold on to this. I can let it go. Or your own mind will tell you, oh yeah, I want you to up your um, intervening bystander game, right? I want you, if you see that again, to butt in with compassion and um, let people know there's other options. So as we do this, we're doing this cleansing and we're doing the ouch and oops for open loops. What do you think? Is that clear enough in description? And we'll go through it in a minute. Yeah, active listening with the ouch and the oops. Perfect. Yeah, so it's a very straightforward little just boop, boop, right? We need to simplify. So does that protocol as a meditation practice makes sense. So we're combining a visualization with an inner inquiry and it's ouch and oops for open loops. Please tell me yes or no, if it makes sense. Excellent. Okay, wait, I got my one yes. This is good. See, I'm sad Jim's power is out because he's usually the other yes. So I at least have two. So I know uh, I can pretend that that's a majority. <laughs> okay. 
how to know uh, when to up your active bystander game or let it go. Um, basically, this is not um, about getting the right answer. It's about listening to what your body wants to tell you, right? So that's what causes the open loop is that there's something usually in there. The reason why, oh, I'm still bugged by this um, social media interaction that I saw is that I haven't gotten from upset to agency. Either I'm wondering, is there something for me to do? Or I know there's something for me to do, or I'm, I can just let it go, but I haven't gone through that inquiry. So we're asking ourselves, what's like, what's true for me? Um, not, uh, not any objective, correct or incorrect. Okay, so let's try it then. Here we go, get my coat on for that. So we're gonna stack ourselves up. This will be a briefer session, and then we'll do um, some other practices for more extended sessions. But for now, find your posture. That can be upright, that could be lying down if necessary, or with your back up against the chair. And let us set up our stupa. So find your solid base. If you want to do the visualization, you could imagine that as a cube on sort of the inner landscape, you could say, or the energy body. And feel that representing that sense of solidity. So as you feel contact with the floor, with the ground, feel the heavy, solid parts of yourself settling, settling, settling. And then in the abdomen, feeling that sphere, or visualizing that sphere, rather. And or just feeling that the watery aspect, the downward flowing aspect, then flows down and fills up this abdomen. And this is a great chance to not be an online fitness influencer and let yourself have a full soft belly full soft belly and that'll actually help that water energy to settle good then the fire element in the chest area and i feel this as like expansive radiant opening expansive radiant opening if you like you could visualize that with a triangle or a tetrahedron red in color is the traditional And then from the throat through the sensory organs, it's a crescent shape, which in three dimensions would be like a half sphere. It's green in color. But what does it represent is the light wind or air element. So as we go up, it gets more and more refined. And then at the crown, you could visualize, if you like, that little drop. It could be white in color or deep blue. And feel the sense of the space element as if the crown were opening to the vastness. Take a moment to rest and enjoy your inner stupa. And then we'll practice an invocation. So if you relate to some symbolic sort of image of the divine, then feel free to imagine that above your head. Like in Buddhist tradition, there's a facet of divinity they call Vajrasattva, which is this white Buddha image. And the, this white is representing purity in that case and luminosity. But for others, you might have an image. Sometimes they'll do this with an image of a guru, and usually with that white color. But if something else presents itself, you could experiment with that. 
in the Taoist tradition, they actually sometimes will feel that the Big Dipper is pouring sacred energy toward you. Um, or you could imagine like the North Star, or sometimes they'll visualize the fusion of the sun and moon above the head, this brilliant light. So find something that works for you. It could even be formless, but we want to have sort of a little point of reference. It's about a forearm's length. They say the length of an arrow above your head. We have this little point of reference. And imagine if you're visualizing an kind of anthropomorphic form, they always say, visualize the deity or the guru as smiling and loving you, wanting you to thrive. Or if it was a more formless, you could just imagine that like whatever conducive forces exist in the universe, whether real or imagined, that's what, that's what this is above my head. And then feeling that this white, like nectar-like radiance, they say it's light, <laughs> traditional yogic imagery, it's light, but it's liquid at the same time. And so this pours down, it's pouring down through the crown and through the whole body. You can just let it not take too long, but it drips down through the crown and the throat and the shoulders and the torso and the belly and the pelvis and the legs, the feet. If it's comfortable for you, put your hands by your side with the palms facing the earth and kind of spread your fingers, which is a mudra of letting go. Sort of tells your brain, hey, I'm not holding on. And now we'll begin to scan back in time. So the first part's easy. You were here with me on this Zoom meeting and you scan back to anything you heard or did or thought, do you have ouches or oopses that happened in that time? And you don't have to find them all or the best one. You just, it's asking within, does anything need to come up? And you imagine that this sort of divine light is pouring through, helping facilitate that process, cleansing. Any of your unresolved tensions flow out and into the earth like a compost to nourish the earth. So if you found an ouch or an oops, it's not necessary that you did, then you want to ask, hey, do I have agency here? Is there anything I need to choose? Is there anything it's mine to do? Could be deciding on an action or could be deciding to let it go. Giving yourself compassion. Every so often, refresh that feeling of divine white light, particularly flowing down, or it could be a crystal clear luminosity, flowing down, washing you out. And then we go back in time a little bit earlier, and then to our little lunch break. Hey, what happened then? Are there any ouches or oops in there that are open loops? There might have been ones that aren't open loops anymore. We just scan within. Oh, anything unresolved? And maybe you found one there. I'm going to just continue to load in this instruction so I can then leave you to practice. But then you would go back to the earlier part of this class and find, oh, was there anything there? Or maybe even earlier today, this morning, before we came to class. Looking for ouch or oops, open loops. And then... Is there something for me to choose there? Okay, one more instruction and then I'll leave you to practice a bit. But we're just gonna continue this going backward in time. So you could go back through your dreams and then into the previous evening and through the previous day. And there's no particular speed you want to find. Oh, are there any little hiccups in my somato-emotional body? How do I find agency? What is mine to do? Is there something for me to do? So let's practice light streaming down.
Then wherever you are, if you're working on one thing, then go ahead and continue that. But let's begin to bring this to completion. Just feeling as if that light has poured down through you. And it's removed any tensions, which are non-conducive constrictions in your body. And they're just made of energy. It's energy that you can't use. And so you pass it on to Mother Earth like a compost. And then feel that you just let go, let that process complete for now. You can let your hands relax. Take just a moment to notice body, breath, and mind. And have a sense of gratitude to yourself for practicing. And we'll gradually deepen the breath a little bit. Oh, come on back into the room together. Okay, it's the ouch and oops for open loops protocol. Just a quickie, but any uh, feedback? Questions? How was that for you? What did you notice? I can share. I noticed one cool one that as I went through the dream last night, I had some kind of disturbed dreams. My sleep was a little like weird. I think I ate too late or something. I had these dreams where like trees were falling down and there were stray dogs coming over and I, they were totally friendly, but I had to find who their people were. And one little dog was riding on the back of a bigger dog. Okay, it was all just weird. But I realized that I was still like the dream guy who had to call the like uh, people to help cut down pieces of trees that were going to fall down and like find that he was still working an open loop in there. And so the whole where my agency was, was to go, that was a dream. You don't have to do anything about that. And it uh, just flushed out. So that was really uh, interesting, unexpected uh, for me. What did you experience? Anything in particular? Let me know. I got one. Love it. Anybody else love it? Anybody hate it? I'll never do it again. Okay, good. We got two love it's. Lyle or otherwise. Neutrals? Any neutrals? Okay, good. A nice a little neutral there. Yeah. So this is a practice. Um, we actually did kind of more of a long form of this than um, we often do, but this is a practice that you can do before your yoga nidra um, and that we'll often do a brief before we do a meditation to clear the decks, right? So um, these are these are these old tantric secrets that one of my lamas is like, they should teach you this on year one. Like it, it would make your meditation just land so much faster and avoid so many problems. Um, so this is like, you're clearing the energy body, you're clearing the emotional body, which is kind of the same thing. And then you just drop right into your meditation from there. So it's a great one to do at Yoga Nidra. And then um, Lama recommends do this before bed. So you clear the day and it's actually, it becomes a dream and sleep yoga practice. Um, one other way you can do this is, and maybe we'll do it together later, but for now, just quickly, is you can do this walking. So if you have sat around all day, you could go for your walk around the block in the evening. You don't have to look like this the whole time, but and just practice your letting go, right? Like Vajrasattva can just float along while you're walking, <laughs> he's not bound by time and space. It's on his little lotus. <clears throat> okay, so cool. Uh, where did this practice come from? Well, it's my fusion of a number of traditional practices. So um, this, obviously, you know, in the Taoist practice, we have these clearing exercises. Um, in traditional Tibetan Buddhism, they do with this with Vajrasattva. Um, and then I have borrowed some of the intention from uh, Lama Lair on the way he teaches this, but the ouch and oops is, uh, came to me this week or a couple weeks ago, actually. And it 
really works for me. Really works for me. So uh, enjoy agency retrieval. Yeah, I love it. And it's kind of like soul retrieval in a way. Like these are also practices that in a more sort of shamanic context, they might call soul retrieval. Because what is the soul? It's your agency. That's that human heartedness of you. And so we, we go and get it back. Okay, so uh, where are we? It is 328. And so let's take a little break. And then when we come back, we're going to do a couple other uh, kind of protocols like this, kind of somato, emotional, nifty energy protocols, um, as well as another longer sit um, with a different style of meditation. And then we will have finished a day together. So I hope you're enjoying yourself. I am. And I will see you in about 15 minutes. So at 3.45 of the clock on Pacific time, um, I'll see you and we'll finish off strong.